Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, well, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Le Beaujolais Nouveau est arrivé. Um, they kind of sound almost Spanish. Anyway, that's French for the Beaujolais Nouveau has arrived. So the third Thursday of November is Beaujolais Day. Now, depending on when I, get, when I got this video done, that day is today. Okay, I mean, I'm recording it on Beaujolais Day, but it may not be out till Friday. It probably will be out today because it's about 9.39. It is 9.39 in the morning it's on Beaujolais Day. So I should have it all done by tonight. Anyway, this was a spur of the moment decision for me. I knew they were coming in and I got to see a couple the day before. And honestly, it's the fact that one of these is, well, essentially a natural wine but I wasn't allowed to buy them. It's like international law or something that you'll go up in a puff of smoke if you're caught buying it before midnight on Thursday. And well, the place wasn't open that late. So I had to settle to get there in the morning. I got there like at 8.30. Anyway, so what's the deal? Isn't it just a super fruity kind of sweet taste in wine that tastes a lot like uh, grape juice and bubble gum? Yeah, it's also been a major marketing campaign for the past 72 years. Now, as early as the 1800s, the people of Beaujolais have been making a wine to celebrate the harvest. Normally, you don't drink a wine in the Northern Hemisphere the same year it's harvested. And it's not like they're the only ones who do it, but basically, as far as anyone else is concerned, well, they are, at least on a global commercial scale. So in 1951, the rules for when the wines of Beaujolais could be sold were loosened. They used to have to wait until December 15th of the harvest year. So that's still really early, uh, anyway, to release the wine. But that year, it was changed to November 15th, and this is when the name Beaujolais Nouveau was created. The key word here is released. So depending on how long it took for the wine to get to the retailer, it could be that day or weeks later. In 1985, it was officially changed to the third Thursday of November. Now, conveniently, that's a week before Thanksgiving here in the United States. But it was still in France until that day. It wasn't until the 2000s that the wines could be shipped earlier outside of France. First in France, uh, and then the rest of the world in the 2010s. So now everyone gets the wine in time to start selling on Beaujolais Day. Part of the history is that there used to be a there used to be races to see how fast bottles could get to Paris. This was purely marketing and started really in the 1960s. The races uh, eventually spread to other parts of the world by the 1990s. I still don't know if they still do them. Uh, what makes this wine different than most other wines is how it's made in the lack of aging. Now, carbonic maceration is the key. This technique is not unique to Nouveau. It's actually a very common practice for most Beaujolais wines. And there's some other wines that do this. Let's turn to Wikipedia or the, the book of knowledge to explain the technique. Quote, whole grapes are fermented in a carbon dioxide rich environment before crushing. Conventional alcoholic fermentation involves crushing the grapes to free the juice uh, and pulp from the skin with yeast serving to convert sugar into ethanol, which is alcohol. Carbonic maceration ferments most of the juice while it's still inside the grape, although the grapes at the bottom of the vessel are crushed by gravity and undergo conventional fermentation. The resulting wine is fruity with very low tannins. It is ready to drink quickly, but lacks the structure for long-term aging. In extreme cases, such as Beaujolais Nouveau, the period between picking and bottling can be less than six weeks. During carbonic maceration, an anaerobic environment is created by pumping carbon dioxide into a sealed container filled with whole grape clusters. The carbon dioxide gas permeates through the grape skins and begins to stimulate fermentation at an intracellular level. The entire process takes place inside each intact berry. Ethanol is produced as a byproduct of this process, but studies have shown that other unique chemical reactions take place that have a distinctive effect on the wine. Beaujolais Nouveau is commonly described as such. Nouveau will have a very bright, fresh red fruit flavors, such as cherry, strawberry, and raspberry, along with fruity ester flavors of banana, grape, fig, and pear drop. 
All right, so what the heck, what the heck's pear drop? Well, it is a British candy that combines the flavors of banana and pear. Yeah, I've never had one either. The name George the Booth is most commonly associated with the style of wine. Most people probably think he invented it. He was probably the person that is most responsible for its popularity, though. He would hold a big party at the winery. Now, I'm not sure if this started at the same time as the races or before, but as I mentioned earlier, this was a wine to celebrate the harvest, so parties were already happening. Old school would have been most likely sometime in December. But De Boeuf, for better or worse, is probably the biggest reason this wine rose in popularity. It's not a serious wine. It was never meant to be. And many times people like me will poo-poo the wines. I know I have from time to time. In general, they're not my style, to put it kindly, but I have had some in the past few years that were actually pretty good. As you can see, I have two here. One is from George Boeuf. He started his business in 1964. He was selling his Puy Fousse wines back then off the back of his bicycle, but he didn't just up and decide to start making wine back then. His family has a history of winemaking going back 400 years in the Maconnet, in the village of uh, Chantre, which is one of the villages of Puy Fousse. He quickly saw the value in the wine region just south of him, Beaujolais. He is what we call a negociant, someone who primarily buys grapes to make wine. While negociants can also own vineyards, they typically don't or only own a small percentage of the, of the vineyards, of, how, of what they make. Burgundy, of which Beaujolais is legally part of, is where this practice really took hold. It's related to the Napoleonic Code or inheritance law that's still in practice today. In general, when you die, all of your children are entitled to equal shares. Now, this is kind of messed up. It was originally when the husband or the man dies, the male children split the estate. Now, the widow still had some kind of power, but she didn't directly inherit anything from what I can tell. I mean, kind of, I don't know, it's confusing, but essentially this code is the reason why, especially Burgundy, has so many owners of vines. Literally, someone can own just a row of vines. This all started in 1804, and it didn't take long for people to not own enough vines to make wine commercially. This is where the negotiant steps in. So George the Boeuf is one of those negotiants, and they make a lot of wine, as in George the Boeuf. Uh, from this nouveau to more serious wines, they are currently located just outside the Moulin Avant Cru in the Romanèche Thor's village. Our other wine is the whole reason for this episode, Domaine de la Prebonde. This is part of the prestigious Kermit Lynch portfolio. Basically, if Kermit Lynch imports it, it's a high quality wine where the wine grower and winery is probably at least practicing organic farming and low intervention winemaking. This winery was founded in 1947, but the actual winery, from what I can tell, has been around much, much longer. Since 1512, as a matter of fact, it's had three name changes in its history, and it's now called, and I'm going to try to get this right because I've done this like 10 times, Domaine de Pobel. And that was after the last original heir, Anna Asmaker married Jules de Pobel. I don't have the prior two names of the winery. There is a third current name, Chateau des Pertonniers, or probably more correctly, the entire name is Beaujolais de Pobel Chateau de Pertonniers. I don't know. Anyway, from the Kermit Lynch website, they practice what is known as Lut Raisonne, or the quote, reason struggle. It's effectively the old name for HVE or HEV in English the official French sustainability certification. There are many, many wineries that practice Lut Raisonne and use the term, but don't bother with the hassle and expense of getting certified and paying yearly fees to stay certified. But in this case, they are at a certified HVE level two. I'll go over that a little bit later. As far as what they have, as far as why they have a second name, I don't know. The phrase un prebond means a tax. The story is that the domain is located where monks used to collect taxes from the villagers. And as the current owner, Ghislaine Dupobel, puts it, quote, monks didn't like to own low-end vineyards. Under the Prebond name, they make just four wines for a total of 3,500 cases. Under their main domain, under their main name of Domaine de Pobel, they make 15 wines for a total of 25,000 cases. And maybe that the Prebond winery is like a negotiant while the, the uh, de Pobel is fruit from vineyards they own or the other way around or some combination thereof. I don't know. Anyway, per the Kermit Lynch website for Domaine de Pobel, they have, they are HVE certified. But I can't confirm that on the website, though, based on this wine having the HV, HVE Level 2 logo, I'm going to guess that their other wines are at least that. As far as winemaking, it sounds very much like natural winemaking to me. This is from the Kermit Lynch website about the Beaujolais Nouveau. 
Grapes are harvested manually without, and vinified without SO2. Fermented naturally under carbonic maceration and aged in stainless steel. Fermentation lasts 8 to 12 days and it's bottled unfiltered. Pretty much all their wines follow similar winemaking techniques. Some things are a little different according to the Kermit, webs, uh, Kermit Lynch website between wines, but essentially they don't do much to the wines. Now let's get the stats for these wines. The 2023 Levon Georges de Bouffe Beaujolais Nouveau, I bought it for $15.99. Beaujolais Nouveau is the designation. It's 100% Gamay, manual harvest by law, by the way, and the ABV is 13%. Yeah, that's all I got. Nothing else. Next is the 2023 Domaine de la Provence Beaujolais Nouveau. I paid $25.95 for it. Beaujolais Nouveau, again, it's the designation, 100% Gamay. Vine age, 10 to 20 years. Soil type, clay, limestone, silica. Vineyard area is 4 hectares. Manual harvest, again, by law. It's an HVV, HVE level 2 wine. It's fully carbonic maceration, aged in stainless steel, fermented 8 to 12 days, unfiltered, no added SO2, and the ABV is 13%. I finally found the three levels of HVE explained. Now, next week's Thanksgiving episode discusses HVE, but I didn't know the differences between the three levels. Here's what I found. This voluntary approach involves three levels. Level one is a prerequisite for access to the process obtained by carrying out a self-assessment by the farmer validated by an accredited auditor. Action plans are then created. Level two has 16 quote best practices around four themes, biodiversity, use of pesticides, fertilizers, water management. At this level, a vineyard could receive the environmental certification label. It is validated by an external audit. Level three is the highest level and provides the certification HVE, high environmental value. Uh, the French is different, it's high, haute valeur environmentale, something like that. Uh, and that's for the entire farm operation. It includes performance requirements measured either by composite indicators or by global indicators corresponding to the four themes. This level is also validated by an external audit after three years of operating at level two. The logo may be affixed to finished products, including wine bottles, containing at least 95% of raw materials from farms with high environmental value, or HVE. Now, I've got links in the description below to learn more. Um, also, just an additional comment, uh, the, uh, whatchamacallit, as I pour the wines, it's not a comment to, you have to have, you have to be doing, it's like, in this case, you have to have three years of level two to get the last to get the last level. Same thing with like certi certifications of organic and um, biodynamic. You you don't you don't just start at it. You have to have the certifications. You have to be audited. You have to show that you're doing this stuff for a certain number of years because what that does is it ensures that your land um, is free of pesticides or supposedly free of pesticides. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that's going on with, with that pesticide drift and all that fun stuff. But effectively, um, you have to, you can't just stop using conventional farming and just be like, hey, uh, I'm organic now and expect to be certified. You have to be doing that practice for a number of years, three-ish, I think for everybody um, to get that certification. I'm excited to try these wines, actually. Later today, right after I finish this, I am having lunch with Anne Bousquet, who is CEO and owner, co-owner with her husband, um, of Domaine Bousquet. Like, you know that winery I do a lot of, uh, I get a lot of wines from? I am super excited to meet her um, and have lunch. And it's a media lunch. I get to wear my media hat. So anyway, let's take a look at these wines and, and do it. I mean, color-wise, they're going to be probably pretty similar. They've got that kind of, actually, the debuff is more of a purple, almost magenta color, whereas uh, the Provend is not as purpley, but it's, it's kind of a, it's definitely red, not quite ruby. Um, also, the Provend has a little more translucency to it. Um, so let's, I'm not going to worry about, tears and all that stuff on the nose. I mean, it's, it smells fresh. Like, so if you've ever gone to a winery right when they are doing fermentation, 
okay, when when they've harvested and, and, and the wines are going through fermentation and you're able to smell that smell that aroma, that's what this smells like. It smells like really fresh wine. Um, and yes, it has that bubble gum, cotton candy, I don't kind of banana laffy taffy type of thing going on. Yeah, it's in there. Red fruit, strawberry, little raspberry. Um, I mean, it's just it's it's a it's a fruity smelling wine. And on the back label, um, they actually. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Um, it has a sweetness indicator, and it's in between dry and medium dry. So. Um, and I don't know what the legal thing is for this. I'm, I'll, maybe I'll look it up and put in a lower third, but I'm going to assume that they can be above four grams per liter. Um, your dry table wine has to be below four grams per liter of residual sugar. My guess is that Beaujolais Nouveau is allowed to be above it, but not much above, maybe like six, seven grams per liter. I'll look it up and put some, put some type of thing on the screen. But yeah, I mean, and you know, there's no oak in this stuff. I mean, they, they put this stuff in stainless steel and concrete tanks. The, the, the boof definitely does that. Um, I, I did. I forgot to put it in my stats. Um, it's not meant to be, you know, a serious wine. There's a little bit of spice component. It is Gamay. Gamay a lot of times has that Christmas spice thing going on. So it's there. It's not as prominent as, say, maybe a Cru Beaujolais or maybe just regular Beaujolais that actually aged a little bit. But you get a little bit of that Christmas spice going on. Let's go ahead and give it a taste. Yeah, it's juicy. It's very bubble gummy, very bubble gummy. Um, cotton candy, red fruits for days, um, kind of sweet. Um, it's not, it's, so it doesn't come across to me as like actually semi-sweet or truly semi-sweet, but there's, there's a sweetness to it. I mean, it actually smells sweeter than it tastes. It's also really the first thing I've had all day, so. It's a fun wine. Is this something that I would buy cases and cases of, like I saw someone this morning at 8.30 in the morning doing? No. But am I going to have fun with this? Am I going to enjoy this at some point in time over the next week or whatever? Yeah, probably. I'll probably, you know, I don't know. Pair, I, we're, we're not going to have Thanksgiving dinner at home, so we're not going to have the usual fare. We'll be at an Italian restaurant as per usual. But, you know, I'll probably pair it with some fun food, maybe like pizza or a burger or whatever. It'll be great for something like that. Um, yeah, it'd be really cool. Or maybe get some, you know, strawberry beignets like I had this past week. Oh, they were okay. They, I, I'm not a beignet expert at all. They tasted good. It's basically a French jelly donut is what it was, or a donut hole, which is French jelly donut, yeah. But this, this would be go, good with something like that. You maybe have it as a breakfast thing uh, or as a dessert thing. Um, for sure, charcuteries, um, kind of uh, sweet cheeses. It, 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 it's tasty. Absolutely. And I like the more I taste it, the more the spice component comes out, that Christmas spice. So it might be evolving in the glass. It might be my palate is kind of getting past the really fruity part and kind of really peeling back those layers and getting more to the traditional gamace thing, but it tastes really good. Hey, have fun with it, right? Who cares what snooty psalms and wine, sno wine snobs tell you? All right, so this one doesn't jump out on the, uh, the glass as much with all those really fruity aromas. It's subtle, there's, there's more of a balance. It, it's, it's really, really subtle, like there's not a lot coming out of the glass, but it's more of a balance between a spice and those kind of bubblegum red fruit thing kind of going on. There's, I mean, it's it's very much less prominent. I mean, I, I smell the Laffy Taffy, but it's like fleeting. It's like I'm, I'm looking for it, honestly, is what it is. But that's a little bit there, you know, bubble gum, not so much cotton candy, but I'm gonna spice, but it is, like, this would be a one I would struggle in a, in a blind tasting. Red wines usually aren't this closed as far as um, aromas. And this is very close. I would be like struggling, like trying to pull anything out of it. But it, it smells more serious. We'll put it that way. I right, just put it on the palate. What? So this is the whole purpose of this episode was to compare two different Beaujolais Nouveaus, one that was being probably made in a more serious style and one that's being made in a truly fun style. And 
they went through the same process, okay, to be made. Um, probably, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't ferment for very long. They didn't age for very long. They were bottled quickly. But this one's really good. I can see why it's 26 bucks. That's the other thing. Like, mostly you know, to me, should be like 15 bucks max. And I've, over the past few years, maybe it's just because what I've been exposed to, I've seen more Beaujolais Nouveaux that are like in that $20, $25 range, or they were supposed to be $20 or $25 and they get discounted 10 bucks. I'm like, there's no way this is a $25 bottle of wine. But this, all right, so it's opening up a little bit more. And yes, you get that fresh, fruity Nouveau, new wine, like you walked into the winery, but it, it's almost like you're at the end of fermentation when you walked into the barrel, walked into the winery uh, or in the barrel room and you're smelling that. Yeah, it's opening up some more. Maybe I just really need to aggressively aerate it, which I mean, they also don't really, they don't really sulfur it. Um, so yeah. So the Christmas spice component really comes through, but it's a juicier, fruitier version of Cru Beaujolais. Um, they are not in a Cru, if I remember correctly. They're, they're like in just regular Beaujolais. They don't make a Cru Beaujolais. They're like in Beaujolais proper farther south. I probably put on the, on the map where they're at. Whereas these guys, they're located next to a Cru. They're not technically in a Cru. They're next to one. But, um, and they do make Cru Beaujolais. But these guys... And this is, I, I'm going to say, you know, maybe they, maybe they buy some fruit from, from around them. Um, plus they have whatever's on their estate. This is fantastic. And this, hey, this is fine. This is, this is nothing wrong with this wine. This is more what I prefer out of a wine, but this is one of those things like, yeah, dude, Matter of fact, I would rather have this as a Halloween wine, but you know, it doesn't come out that early. <laughs> They're barely, they barely harvested by then. Now you could hold on to a wine. Now, could, could you age these wines? Not really. Like Beaujolais Nouveau after a couple years um, is probably fine, like this style. This one might age. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I don't work with a lot of unsulfured wines. And, S, you know, when you add SO2, that is one of the ways to preserve wine for longer. It's not the only way. Um, there are other factors in, especially with red wine, that help contribute to ageability. But SO2 does help with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's more aromatic now. I think it just needed to open up a little bit. But yeah, you get cranberry, raspberry, a little, little bit of uh, um, sour cherry. Um, you get touches of those bubblegum... Laffy Taffy, more on the nose rather than the palate, but then the Christmas spices, your your frankincense myrrh, your cinnamon um, type of thing is coming through. There's no oak on this. This is what Gamay does. Gamay has these components without oak, and that's one of the things I love about Gamay. Um, yeah, and there's a little more structure to it. There's a little more tannic to it. Uh, even though it's a lighter looking wine, um, I feel the tan a little bit more. Gamay is not a high tanning grape, but there is a little more structure to this. It's like a serious Beaujolais Nouveau. Man, that's super good. Wow. So at the end of the day, listen, don't rely on, like I said, don't rely on me or other, some other sommelier or wine expert or critic or your buddy down the road who knows more about wine than, than anyone else knows. Don't let them sit there and go, well, this is crap. It's not crap. I mean, it may not be something that that person likes, if you like it, go ahead and drink it. I don't care. I mean, yes. Do I, do I make little comments about certain wines and stuff like that? Yeah, because I may not particularly care for their winemaking practices and I may not like the, what they do to a wine, but some of these wines are some of those popular wines in the world. So who am I to tell you not to drink it? Drink if you like. Hey man, I like Coke and McDonald's. Man, I was excited yesterday. The McRib is back. I didn't get a McRib, but man, McRib and one of these, We'd be, yeah, actually, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some McRib on the way home one of the nights, and I'm going to crush this, the George the Boeuf with the McRib. I thought the McRib was done, but apparently it's not. Did you know in Germany there's a place that apparently sells it year-round? Yeah, anyway, that's the thing. We all have our guilty pleasures. We have stuff that we like that's mass-produced, um, stuff that maybe other people don't think is good. 
and we love it. So who cares what the naysayers say, what the haters say, whatever, you know, Taylor Swift in the, the song that she has, whatever. Anyway, drink what you like. That's going to do it for this episode. Uh, as always, you know, make sure you click the like button, subscribe to the show, tell your friends about it, and uh, we'll see you next week for Thanksgiving. Cheers.